Science, Science. Environment, Environment. Medicine. Medicine. Energy. Energy. The New Biology by Dr. Stefan Lanka. Vielen Dank an die Veranstalter und alle dahinter, die das möglich gemacht haben, dass ich hier heute reden kann und darf. In Part 1, we saw how biology is not and learned where these concepts came from in our history. Why we believe in material defect carriers from the classical humoral teachers derived from disease poison. The word virus is a Latin word meaning poison. And of course the change to what disease poison has become, a dangerous virus, now a plethora of viruses. We heard the cellular theory of life, postulated in 1858, with absolutely no proof that all life originates from a cell and all disease poisons are produced by a cell, which then suddenly accumulates and which we catch when they leave the cell. In the case of coronavirus, it came from bats, yeah, then jumped to humans at the fish market in Wuhan and then mutated so it's weaker. Then the virologists realized the numbers don't work. There were too many contradictions, so they said the virus had become harmless and then called it Omicron. And it multiplies like the devil but does nothing, resulting in everyone being immune, and then declaring the pandemic over. First in Spain, then Denmark, now recently in Czech Republic, Great Britain, everywhere, Corona is finished. To better understand how this concept was established and how the cell theory of life is wrong, I can deconstruct it so we have a better explanation of life. And there it is. I want you to imagine it so it gives us back confidence in life and above all shows us how biology really is. That there is no malice there, only a symbiosis for all equally, which of course leads to a lack of aggression. That's been a mission for us humans for a long time, to try to avoid aggression so we have no violence, no war, no good or evil into which our purely material thinking of life has forced us into. Today's model of a cell looks something like this. We have a water-filled interior surrounded by a membrane with transport capabilities in various places. There are reticulum for communication. In the middle, the cell nucleus is surrounded by these apparati from which proteins allegedly arise. Funnily enough, these tiny dots, the ribosomes from the word rib, merged from the mythology into the theory of genetic information being in proteins. But there are many tissues or so-called cell types that don't have any nucleus, like muscle cells, for example. This whole structure is a theoretical construct that in reality doesn't exist. From the 1970s, this scientist and his colleagues worked in this field, Harold Hillman. Look for nice little films on the internet showing living tissue that rotates at the core while everything around it remains static, thus proving it cannot be as science portrays it. All the journalists back then wrote that Harold Hillman rocked the boat. I thought, yes, this will cause an outcry. The whole cell model is wrong. We think in cells for everything. All our theories of disease lie in cells, and it's wrong. That's what Virchow thought, and those are false interpretations. Harold Hillman shows us in analysis of electron micrographs that the thickness of the membrane surrounding our cells should appear bigger if I slice the cell further down through more membrane than right at the center pole. But we find it to be the same width everywhere. That cannot be. Mathematics and geometry refute this. Also, the assumption that the cells have to pump ions to restore the ion balance for current flow has never been seen on any single electron micrograph. 
all the cell receptors to which the viruses should attach with their spike proteins. The ACE2 receptors that no one has ever seen are all models, imaginings, to justify a theory of communication that is actually regulation. It only takes place in a model which is incorrect and which was invented in 1858 by Virchow. In reality, our three-dimensional tissues have a core that flows freely. Remember from the first part, that important article from Der Zeit on June 12, 2008 called Genetics in Dissolution. Find it on the internet. There, you'll see that genetics gave up on the idea of a stable hereditary substance or chromosome that doesn't change, but they found that the nucleic acid is different in each nucleus, and the nuclei move freely, and that there are edges to the tissue. In the bone marrow, there is separation, which you see as white blood cells, and these are the only cells that actually exist. The rest are locked in tissue. Like I already said, from 1850 onwards, the humoral theory was disproven when they discovered that every organ consists of three different tissue layers called the inner germ layer, the outer germ layer, and the middle germ layer. And if one changes in a so-called disease state and this change doesn't diffuse into the other two tissues around them or next to them, then there can be no disease toxin. This was one of just many proofs that the theory of disease toxins didn't match the picture of disease or cancer metastasis. These are all things that have long been disproved but still prevail because we are still in a materialistic explanation of life and any other explanations are suppressed. I refer to an article in Der Spiegel from 1977 called Cancer, Disease of the Soul, wherein it stated the international psychosomatics found people become ill when they can't resolve trauma. But why is one affected in the mind, but in another the belly, another the heart, and another the bones? They couldn't work it out. They examined all the material parameters, but nothing correlated. In the meantime, they partly dissolved. Something else they discovered was that there are cases all over the world of people with a diagnosis that they should never have survived and situations where everyone said, no way, they will die, but who completely healed. And they concluded that no doctor should ever give anyone a death sentence because it's another trauma which can't be resolved. For the first time in 2,500 years, this man rediscovered the lost body-soul biology, and he is actually the first in 2,500 years to take the evil completely out of medicine and no longer calls disease illnesses, but instead meaningful biological special programs. He rediscovered the body-soul biology from the scientific foundation built by Plato, whose teacher was Socrates. I would like to come back to this book by Seamus O. Mahoney called Can Medicine Be Cured? No, medicine is broken. Only a war or humanitarian disaster can reset it. Five times he makes a statement of faith like the vaccinations helped, the antibiotics helped, but on page 262 he comes to the astonishing conclusion that there are after all two different medical systems one where the symptoms are suppressed with medicines so that we can quickly return to work Plato and one that is named after Panacea the daughter of Asclepius and there I found the most beautiful definition of health I've ever heard health is harmony within myself with my surroundings and O'Mahony writes, this second medical system never stood a chance. So this knowledge was there, and he rediscovered it. How did he do that? His son died. He developed testicular cancer and asked the other patients with the same diagnosis if they had also lost a child. Then they cried and asked him how he knew that, and said, yes, it happened to me too. 
Next, he goes to Siemens and gets a brain tomography, records the brain in layers, and finds everyone with this cancer diagnosis has a signal in the same place in the brain. The same with women who had breast cancer. Exactly the same. This was the case with all so-called cancers. He also finds it with the skin. The same everything. And with computer tomography, he linked every part of the body to a correlating part of the brain and made tables to work from. Shown here with the germ layers that we know come from embryology. He shows where each trauma or biological conflict will affect tissue changes, how it builds up to be able to cope in a given situation, to improve digestion, or is broken down, as in the bones, to improve mobility. He calls them meaningful biological special programs. So, then when I look at his table and all the biological conflicts, a trauma is now turned into a positive thing, into a function that the skin has when we need it for defense or to hold tight. The function organs have, or the tissues that we can't see. I can look up their function, and there is a construction plan of the human being. Dr. Hamer found it. Namely, the proof that every part of the body is a materialized unit of consciousness with its own function. We see evidence for this in how a word can cause not only cardiac arrest, but also affect the skin. You can see it. It can affect my self-worth, which leads to bone decomposition. Dr. Hamer has proven that we materialize consciousness. He brought the spirit back into science and put it on a scientific foundation because when someone has a symptom, I can tell you where you'll see a signal in the brain or if I look at the brain, I can tell what's going on in the body. Then I had the good fortune to become friends with the great biochemist, Erwin Shargaff, who was my advisor and teacher. After our first fight, when I still thought they were cheating, he told me, Stefan, if you ever find something or even stumble upon something and you think it's right, I'll give you two tips. If it matches the preferred stance or the mythology, then it is not proof that it is correct, but it is a hint that it might be correct and important. And look, I suddenly noticed the colors of the germ layers are the four colors of the Vedic philosophy. The Golden Age the silver, the copper, and the iron. Here, the digestion or ectoderm like a bowl or a symbol for the upside-down omega. Simple. When lightning strikes, then more digestion helps me. When the sun shines again, trauma solved, reversed. It works the same with the pericardium heart sac, the skin, etc. Here, the plus sign means to reinforce or fortify, to better protect. In bacteria, we call that gram positivity. A Hungarian, correction, it was actually a Danish bacteriologist named Dr. Hans Christian Gram, named it when he discovered that bacteria form thicker membranes when they encounter acid or heat to protect themselves. And we say those gram-positive bacteria are the very dangerous ones because they protect themselves from antibiotics with thicker membranes. These are life principles that fit with everything living. Here, gold, full reduction force, digestion, is right in life's energy flow. Little pain in the healing phase, little fever. Here, a bit more pain further from the energy flow. Here, even further away, bone, tendon, muscles, they dissolve in a trauma. You are worth nothing. Unexpected bad news letter. You're fired. You're worthless or bullied and you can't stand it. The hip ulcerates and then builds up again in the healing phase. The same principles apply for contact. All the sensory organs, the outer skin, the lining of the vessels, checking you have enough oxygen, energy, heat, etc. And when the lightning strikes here, 
then the tissue breaks down to a thinner skin. And when I have contact again, like a child enrolls in school and feels ripped away from its mother, father, and siblings, and the skin is too thin, so straight away it builds it up again. And that is what we call measles. So what we call diseases are actually meaningful biological special programs, and there are always two phases to each program. The degradation or deterioration phase we call one disease, and the resulting building up or repairing phase we call another disease. But in reality, they go together. And here we have a lady with an ulcerated right hip. She was bullied in the workplace. When she leaves, the bone builds back up again and there is pain. She is advised to leave that job because otherwise the hip could completely collapse. People store their renal kidney water when they suffer a trauma of being abandoned or are on the run or their existence is threatened. The kidney saves water, which is quite intense when everything is swollen and no drops come out. Those are the people who need dialysis. But then we have another challenge, because if the kidney retains water, we have a metabolic backlog and every symptom, things we wouldn't normally feel at all, become bigger and stronger, turning a mouse into an elephant. This is what it looks like when the trauma is resolved. Suddenly, the black ring disappears and turns white from the outside in disproving again the metastasis theory that one disease spreads to other body parts, as that would go white from the inside out, not outside in. But when doctors see that on the brain or anywhere else on an organ, they say the cancer is spreading, that disease poison is there. I'd advise you to learn this knowledge before you get a diagnosis like this. I have never seen anyone survive a second diagnosis. A first diagnosis, okay, then we can tweak the diet and work out what we did wrong, too much smoking, or that's wrong, or what do I know. But a second diagnosis? That floors most people and makes them depressed. They have no more drive, nothing, and they cave. Meanwhile, it's quite easy to have a scan analyzed by a suitable therapist who will tell you what it's all about. Dr. Hamer found out that in the areas of female sexuality, pictured here on the biggest red ring as principal contact, here is the male one. If we see activity here for over nine months, then we can die of a heart attack in the healing phase. It slows the pulse down, but people can be easily saved via a shock. Papa, you can't die! Or you can put chili powder in their mouth. In the Black Forest, a 93-year-old man was in his coffin, luckily not screwed down yet, and he comes to and finds he's in a shroud. The morticians who washed them respectfully had put another layer over to cover him. Anyway, he climbs out of the sack, looks and sees he is naked, and the ten men standing around cleaning, plus the coffin bearers, jumped out of their skin. He was apparently dead. Brain death was diagnosed. In a healing crisis, the brain also switches down a gear. Well, you can't have a current because that's for oxygen metabolism, so you are considered or diagnosed brain dead and taken away. And here, there is much to say because activities in these four brain areas control our social behavior, whether we are manic or depressive, whether we are autistic or bioaggressive, you can see it all. Dr. Hamer called these double activities antenna because they give us extra powers to see clearer, to sense things that you wouldn't normally have sensed. I always remember that in many cultures, so-called handicapped people are considered holy and asked what's going on. I also remember that some autistic people are able to perceive things in a flash. This knowledge shows that we spiritually change when a trauma happens that is beyond our control. We lose awareness of our actions when something is too alien or life-threatening. Furthermore, this knowledge is so important that I'm sure it could be the foundation for peacemaking capabilities in humanity. To know how I function myself, why I sometimes go crazy, 
what gives, what's wrong, etc. Because if we do not even understand ourselves, then we cannot judge others. And that is one of the good messages that I now happily, gladly bring you. Because this knowledge frees us from fear that can very quickly become dangerous and deadly. A good friend of mine, Siegfried Mohr, a very good therapist in his field, shows here the four brain areas which makes us more masculine or more feminine, etc. He found that the whole history of mankind can be explained by these principles. We also fall into social constellations collectively, into mania, into depression, etc. collectively, through wars, ice ages, or what do I know, into corona. It trips those up who believe in it. They are fixed and ready. Those people who take selfies at the vaccination center, crying with joy, they are finally protected, finally liberated, and at last, holidays. And at last, I'm finally safe from those weirdos who don't wear masks, those terrorists. And then they wonder why three weeks later they are sick. That is the latency period, and the first place affected is the skin. Remember, the symptoms show up after resolution of the trauma. We already knew a hundred years ago, this is a drawing made a hundred years ago, it was known that our so-called cells never have contact with our nerves. Rather, they are embedded in a substance which itself has an energy-rich vibration through which all transportation in the body flows, conducting electrical current without any resistance. They now call this superconductivity. Also, cells do not sit next to each other at all. This painting gets that wrong. They're not so close together in reality. These would only be misinterpreted procedural artifacts from looking at dying tissue, not living tissue. It's dehydrated, it's been dyed and compressed, etc., and then viewed. It is important to note that this tissue, presented as connective tissue, is not connective tissue. It is, in fact, the substance from which we all came from and will become. This substance has a high density and a very high energy content, and it is structured in such a way that the oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse easily into the ascending nerves and the descending nerves, and a continuous alarm in the brain is what pulls the energy up from below. The nerves transport this liquid up and it is released into the spinal cord. From there, the nerves distribute it throughout the body to supply all of the organs with energy, which also themselves release energy. And so through this circuit, the whole body knows when there is suddenly an alert. Then, the signal goes out without anyone having to even think about it. This was clear to me because I did my research on the tissues and the dense substance we are made of. I knew even before I met Dr. Hamer in the year 2000. In a flash, it was clear when he took a CT scan of my brain, analyzed it, and told me what had happened to me in my past. That was when I thought, wow, this is verifiable. It's scientific. It's comprehensible and the critical third criterion for science, it's predictable. What happened next? It was clear to me that lactic acid diffuses and it's continuous when we are in constant stress because you are no longer metabolizing oxygen, just like a boxer. The best trained people manage 12 rounds of three minutes and can continue dancing around. The world champion was Muhammad Ali, who made cheeky jokes, was super at dancing, and saved all his power until the end of the fight to throw a lucky punch, and so he became the world champion. That was strategy. And the swarthy Asians manage a maximum of three five-minute rounds. Okay, that's still full-body contact, but in any case... I can't go longer than three minutes maximum, full power, under oxygen, so my metabolism switches over. 
to just sprint 400 meters, I am still on oxygen. But 2,000 meters or a marathon and the muscles switch off of oxygen and run on fermentation instead. So, why does it ferment when the lactic acid diffuses? To make the same amount of energy by fermentation, I need 16 times as much sugar as when oxygen was available. That's why people who are in constant stress have very high sugar needs. The lactic acid is toxic, so it has to diffuse away to where it will be neutralized. There, a water siphon is created that is naturally three-dimensional, and when I cut through this, I see a black ring. Dr. Hamer called that a Hamer lesion. If this fermentation lasts for weeks, months, even years, then our tissue is built up from cartilage sulfur into hyaluronin. Everyone's heard of that. Women now have injections of it for wrinkles above, below, everywhere. Hyaluronin is a tissue that is optimized for fermentation instead of oxygen because it makes sugar flow smoothly but not oxygen. And this is now crucial. Once the conflict ends, the black ring is instantly gone. There's clear evidence that you can't see anything there anymore, but that tissue has changed. Spherical. And then in the healing phase, the transformation happens and it turns white from the outside inward so you can see how the healing is progressing. Here, oxygen and sugar still flow to the nerve center of the brain. The energy gets sucked in and out again. Remember, the whole body is in the brain. But if this alone takes up too much energy, then oxygen and sugar will no longer pass through here and a brain infarction occurs. In the very worst case, in white, if the blood has not dispersed, maybe a vessel nearby has ruptured, that has a much worse prognosis. A white stroke, where under pressure, the tissue needs oxygen but does not get it and implodes. Or a red stroke, where a vessel does flow into that area that was fermenting and is now optimized for oxygen again so it is deficient. This is confirmed by heart surgeons and neuropathologists who state that no matter if a red or white stroke, there's no trace of oxygen nor bacteria that uses oxygen in there. It's all full of lactic acid. So that's the model from myself and the master, Dr. Hamer. It has been verified in all aspects to date. This helps therapists to predict things and guide you through the healing process or pause it so that you don't suffer a heart attack or the likes in the healing crisis. My role is to develop a brain scanner that detects this without radiation but instead harmless rays and a simple technique already in use to see through the side of the lungs. I'll try to apply this technique to the brain and to popularize it we could receive brain scans by mobile phone. Then we can say, oh, your hip hurts, you have tooth loss, hormone status, whatever you want. And people will wonder how we know. That is my idea, how via market mechanisms, we will very gently displace antibiotics by having, like in Japan or China, two medical systems running parallel together. And then the better one will prevail on its own. Now, the basics of understanding why what we are made of turns the ring white suddenly on a brain scan. The most important thing is knowing about this substance that forms tension around water and the gigantic force that holds it together. This substance is well studied, but is mistakenly called the fourth substance of life. It is a substance in its own right that was formerly called eta, out of which jellyfish are made and which live, work, and coordinate without a brain or nerves. We also know that this current flows in them without resistance. These tardigrades are immortal, experimented on for 100 years, irradiated with every wave, exposed to acid, even allegedly sent into space. They have 100-year-old samples that are absolutely desiccated, dehydrated, no metabolism, nothing. 
yet put a drop of water on them, and in 10 minutes they live again just fine. They completely disprove the cellular theory of life, because how does the biochemist's convoluted story of chromosomes work? First, make the chromosomes, then the proteins and other such matter? No. Boom, it's immediately there. Here we learn more important stuff. This smart one has an algae that does everything for him. He just lays in the sun and it's great, but this one has it not so good. He lives in a basement, in darkness. He has no photosynthesis like this one does, and he makes arrows and magazines with up to seven arrows to shoot larger animals. What do we learn? Need begets violence. This is a tadpole and a terrible experiment, but worth showing, because it shows that the substance from which we come is gelatinous, fat-soluble, has a high density, weighs more than 1.4 kilos or 3 pounds per liter, and if we take an eye out and replant it anywhere else on its body, straight away it can see again, long before optic nerves could form, of course. But as the nerves do start to build up, it disrupts the whole development and the tadpole dies. This is a double tissue thing that also disproves our whole model of biology. The same with the geneticists as we learned from Genetics in Dissolution, the article from Der Zeit in 2008. Genes are all imagined. All their ideas disproved. Everything because there is no stable chromosome. But virologists don't mention this. They carry on regardless. Even these researchers do not go public with this, saying we just have to keep studying this willow leaf larva, which can become a bonefish or a different fish. Some can become freshwater fish, some sea fish, etc., which also proves that the whole theory of life is false. When they have used up their yolk and there are no nutrients in the water, they still grow. We now know why. Because by contact with water, they pick up this substance, which is dense, soluble fat and the building substance of life. This gel-like substance with high ohm density, electrical resistance which turns volts into currents of amperes, from which every living thing consists. Physics investigated it with Dr. Leonard Bugel. He was a professor who was interested in optimizing the dispersion of water membranes for drilling with ceramic cooling processors so the membrane wouldn't break them. He measured voltages to find agents in the water that stabilized the membrane. He didn't even notice that when you remove the weight, the membrane immediately shrinks up naturally. When I feed it again with a drop of water, the water transforms, the drop disappears, and the membrane widens again. So basic properties of life are already visible in this membrane, the contraction and the growth. I learned that from the East Berlin biologist Dr. Peter Augustin Selig in 1996, four years before I ran into Dr. Hamer. So it was immediately clear what Dr. Hamer's brain rings were. Water is compressible. For example, I take 1.5 liters of water and 1.3 million meters, or 130,000 atmospheric pressure, where our car tires would have long since blown out, and compress, and we get this gel-like substance with a density of about 1.4 kilos per liter. So imagine we are made from this power. If we take away just one meter of pressure, the whole water column spills over. That's how we are able to move mountains with this power. And women are able to lift a truck that just ran over her child, or the Shaolin monks direct their energy power to a single point. The Chinese call it chi, and in India they call it prana. These examples show what we are made of what power we hold, and ability to perform things that can only be explained if we know we are made of this substance. 
That's why I always say substantial. Think in substance, not particles, like the atomic theory, which 2,500 years ago Democritus established as a state-supported philosophy, forcing us to think only in atoms. And as kids, what happened was our imagination was impaired, not only impaired, but castrated. Chargaff, in his book Outlook from the Third Floor, says... If the physicists take away our imagination, or the children's, they would destroy the foundations of human life. In the Bible, it says, if you don't become like children, you can't solve the challenges that we have. The atomic theory simply destroys our imagination. We're thinking, here's these things, nuclei and electrons and the energy around it, and underneath there is nothing, a vacuum. Thinking is so complicated in particles, yet no one understands what they see. That we are integrated in this cosmos because of transpiration, meaning passing water vapors from a living body through membranes or pores. This is something plants do, what our blood does. In the 70s, Japanese plant physiologists looked for natural materials which determine whether a bud will become a leaf or a flower. A flower gives energy, a leaf makes energy, and the hormone has never been found. But what has been found is that the plant makes a high energy liquid. Who would have thought it? Viscous, fat soluble, they named it pea water from Sanskrit, meaning life energy. And funny enough, in Greek, pea means the boundary or edge where the water ends is different than the water. That's exactly what is produced. Because the plant has a flower which gives energy, gives beauty, smell, attraction. Then they looked at how it works. How does the plant do that? They found that it's magnetite that's bound to a protein and that the iron 2 form of magnetite is water soluble, polar, while the iron 3 form is fat soluble. So this membrane is extracted from the water and made available to our system. When I saw the patent specification of what they'd patented, I was like, wow, they described an energy release mechanism that is everywhere where water and minerals are. There is this substance release that life is made of, and that explains something no one has ever explained, why the oceans are full of nucleic acid and they can't say what it's from. Why? Because the RNA arises by itself. Now everyone's talking about it, and a more stable version is the DNA that we discussed in the first part. This also explains why static or still water energy is low. It's because the membrane is not as well formed as in moving water, or when I connect this magnetite to it, virtually, so to speak. What I've shown here is scientifically and incredibly accurate and has been applied broadly with unbelievable success to agriculture, medicine, and technology, but has fallen into oblivion. And we also see iron 2 and iron 3 in this patent, so it's clear how our red blood pigments work. Iron 3 goes into the apoferritin protein and delivers the building substance to us, and the iron 2 fetches from the flowing water. Therefore, red blood cells do not need a cell nucleus, no nucleic acid, which is a primer to release energy. In both animals and humans, we have hemoglobin with iron. Chlorophyll has magnesium, and that is almost identical, only one promil difference between chlorophyll and hemoglobin. So it is also clear that we humans can do photosynthesis. That's why we like to go out in the sun. That's a picture of an amoeba, which has these little fingers we saw in the first part, and how slices of it were presented as viruses, although it has never been sliced through the middle to prove they actually have only one round particle. Also, the control experiments were not done. We know it and they admit it, because it's already virtually the same with these amoeba. They consist of this fatty substance with only a few water vacuoles where there is water. We're back in the cell theory of Virchow, 
who went with the idea that a cell is filled with water because Virchow had no idea, and the one from whom he took that idea had no idea either, when all other tissue researchers were sure that it is fat-soluble. Here we see a vortex on a drop of water. As soon as water absorbs or releases energy, it takes on a vortex form. And this happens not only in moving water, this happens also in water that's cold, which is here in this room where there's no humidity. When energy is released, it becomes mist. When the sun shines in here, it's invisible again. When more energy is released, then we get rain, and this pervades the whole cosmos. It also causes what we call gravitation, because all substances that exist come from this substance and then go back into this substance. Thales of Miletus knew this. That is the cause of gravity, because there is no vacuum in space. What we have here, everywhere are membrane systems that grow bigger and bigger. Permeability to radiation of specific length depends on the size, etc. Ultimately, our cosmos is made up of cohesive membrane systems, and this is what NASA found out, or claims. Our galaxies sit together like a rubber band, which oscillates in one piece. We also find the principle of synchronicity everywhere. The vortex principle I presented shows the most effective way to produce energy is the vortex, and where it is most concentrated, there is the highest energy. So we find the vortex principle everywhere we look. Victor Schauberger discovered it on the macro scale. You see it everywhere. These are jellyfish, each 30 centimeters in diameter, and when they want to reproduce, because they live in the sea, which is very energy poor, they form giant vortices up to 300 meters in diameter. They conduct high energy through the gelatinous substance in the center of the vortex, and there they reproduce. Marine biologists know this, but amazingly, have no explanation for it, because they are taught to think in particles and not substance. Let us think on this substance of which we are using the ethos of Aristotle, which Dr. Peter Augustine rediscovered. Then we can also lose our so-called circulatory system. Harvey was the first to discover it in the 17th century, and you can read about it in Wikipedia. He was the first to recognize the principle of the cycle, but he believed that matter lives outside of the cell and can transform itself, so that's why we can't admit him to the Hall of Science. But he did see this first. What did he see? That the heart is not a pump. The heart is a vortex generator. It sets up a vortex that activates a current, a pulse. Boom, 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 boom. The substance, the water vortex surface substance, is released into the tissue, and also the nerves pick it up. Again and again, the whole vascular system is mapped on the brain and can show us whether there is a vascular system alert about swelling, etc., that can become dangerous. In Chinese philosophy, the veins are our heating elements. They absorb this substance, and because it is dense, during the energy release back to water, we get a nearly 50% volume increase, and that pushes the blood passively through the creek, stall, fold, and back into the heart. Today, people are being kept alive with a small, noiseless external pump, because cardiologists found when people had a pump inserted that they thought needed a pulse, it made such a hell of a noise that most wanted to switch it off, or they wanted it changed because it was unbearable. And now, a few dozen people are running around with their blood being swirled with a small direct turbine pump that simply makes a vortex. If they want to run faster, then they can switch to a higher rotation. At first, we also believed that a return flow pump was needed, but it wasn't, because they found the blood returns all by itself. Now we know why. I have a completely different picture of the body, of the connections above all the integration with the cosmos that the atom-particle theory prevented. 
Before we got this war principle, we had as above, so below, and the atomic theory ruined it. Because Democritus said, if we continue to cut through a hemp rope, then suddenly it is no longer hemp, no longer known matter, but atoms, which we can't describe, but must somehow be there. And this atom theory was then used as an explanation of life. They bond with each other and make molecules and so on. This is 2,500 year old cheese. Not only does it stink, but it is simply incorrect and has led us into a dead end. And maybe thank God we're in this dead end, because we need change from this global dogma. The weakest part of the whole theory is the virus, because we can all say yay or nay, there is one or there isn't one. Are they scientific or are they not scientific? That's all there is to it. That is an RNA. This one is a typical RNA shape. They continuously form loops and proteins that are catalytic in themselves. They only arise when a bit of organic matter has accumulated, plus a little mineral. In the process, they appear in all possible conceivable variations, and what fits in the metabolism stays there longer. Therefore, we can learn to deal with them. For example, alcohol or toxins. Bacteria learn very quickly to metabolize anything I offer them. If it doesn't kill it right away, as they say, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Yeah. That was the first experiment with bacteria that we did as a biologist, to see the bacteria suddenly digest toxins by increasing the concentration and removing the normal nutrient solution. Then the bacteria live exclusively on this poison or on antibiotics. Then, when I suddenly return the original nutrient solution, they die. They must first relearn the previous substance, and that is what makes the RNA, which arises in many variations. That is why I can make anyone test positive for anything if I say that is a gene sequence for this, that, or the other. I just have to look hard enough to find it, or I just let the PCR run so long that it generates sequences that were never even there, and I can say, look here, I have something. So, this principle always surfaces, and now you understand that it's the RNA, and that the RNA itself works as a catalyst. Now, another presentation of life and how seemingly invisible life emerges from this substance out of water. Here, we have a model of the so-called DNA, and we see it is wound up. It is constantly building up and breaking down. It oscillates and is called a metabolism resonator, a stabilizer, but it is not the metabolism dominator in any respect. It primarily serves to release energy, and the geneticists have long established that the DNA is completely developed. It dances, no joke. In the core are all of our chromosomes completely disintegrated in knots. How do you explain that? I can explain it. They build up completely and then break down completely. So first up, then down again, up again, down again, as if it's a constant transforming and arising. That's what we know about it today. Someone who thinks in cellular pathology cannot explain what they see because his thinking is too complicated, and he thinks in models which are not correct, into which we have all been forced, are a part of our history, and that now gave us corona. I say thank God, and not only thank God for bringing this global dogma to its demise, to a controlled implosion, otherwise it would explode in an uncontrolled manner for other reasons, which I explain in this issue of Wissenschaft Plus. This magazine has been out since 2003. It's a treasure trove of knowledge that to this day exists nowhere else, not yet. All the knowledge we have accrued over the years on the cases is all documented in there, written over the years. Why, for the first time in the history of mankind, do we have a disease definition that is open? Everything else was always 20 to 25, 30 symptoms for AIDS. Measles has 20 symptoms, flu, influenza, 25 symptoms, but corona is open. COVID is open. Why? The Chinese said, no, it is not SARS. 
all this panic when no one has infected anybody. Documented by the Chinese government, no one with pneumonia had infected others, neither work colleagues, friends, neighbors, or even hospital staff. So it is not SARS, whereupon they invented a new disease. Plus, for the first time in the history of medicine, everyone is constantly being tested. We used to only test symptomatics with an antibody test. If they tested the entire population, they would have generated the same positive results everywhere, and people do not know that. Even the people who are now oiling this engine, those who profit, and they need to profit from it. Consider how we've invested in genetics for 60 to 70 years. Billions, and on every corner there is a biotech business. Yet nothing ever comes of it except tests that have no significance whatsoever. Read the article in Der Zeit, a rather good release in 2008. So about these pandemics. They get their money out periodically and glad of it because otherwise the money market would collapse for certain. Corona also gives us a breather. Those people who orchestrated it, all of those spouting corona from their mouths have all proven they're anti-scientific, all of them, by their, their anti-democratic actions. Bringing censorship in without an infectious disease law to justify the intrusion on our inalienable fundamental rights. Tom Holland shows where this comes from. Without legitimizing censorship, without legitimizing the interference with our dignity, Anyone who contradicts the narrative will be publicly shamed. But it's great if you endured it. Then it's great. Why? Because all of them have proven their anti-constitutionality, and thus they are all out the window along with their pension rights. And that's good news. We are the people, and we rock the boat. That was said of Dr. Harold Hillman. We are learning now, and we have a great opportunity, not only to learn in biology, but also, more importantly, in the monetary system. Silvio Gassel predicted 100 years ago, money must not accumulate, it must flow in the economy. A very big, important thinker. If money is not a means of exchange, but a means of power, then it is clear it causes scarcity, and scarcity always leads to aggression, to war, and I want that to stop. And here in this format, we've already had so many great talks about money, its meaning in that it is no longer a means of exchange. We talked with Kurt Rhein, and that's why it hurts. That's another subject, though, and that brings me to my second part. 100 years ago, Rudolf Steiner, with his social incorporation of the state, said, I don't need more equality in the economic system. I have no incentive to do that, but I need equality in the legal system. I need freedom in the sciences, in art, in education, but I need fraternity in the economic system. And this is the socialist outline he had, and now he runs the shop, and we can do that too. That is the task for all of us, and I am so grateful for this platform to be able to present the subject. To know is relevant. Here is our new look, Science Must, that was previously called Science Plus. And now may I present Lanka Vision. This is the new logo, and soon you will hear even more visions that I have of life, and above all, our constant increase in knowledge. I thank you very much for that and those that made it possible to get this information out and working. Vielen Dank.